co-chair of the group of friends for sport uh, at the United Nations. So uh, this morning we will have uh, many examples of uh, how sport is impacting the three pillars of sustainable uh, development, but also uh, all the principles that have been uh, undertaken by UN Women for Sport for gener Generation Equality Framework. So I would like, because uh, as a UN uh, uh, permanent representative, I want to emphasize how much uh, has been achieved in the General Assembly since uh, 1993. And I go back to 1993 because this is the year that uh, as a resolution on building a, a better and peaceful world through sport and the Olympic ideal was adopted. Uh, from there, you know, we had the Beijing Platform of Action in 1995. Uh, of course, we have uh, uh, the creation of UN Women in uh, 2010 and the political declaration of uh, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015. So much has been achieved since then, but still, uh, we are not there where we want to be in terms of uh, uh, gender equality, uh, but also uh, we have to uh, realize that uh, the next generation, the next gen, as we, we call them, uh, is already uh, there and they are very active and uh, they, they are the one who are bringing about social change, environment consciousness, and uh, with that impact, uh, economic uh, changes also. So, uh, of course, we are having that webinar in the context of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, this has, uh, of course, impacted everybody's life, but also uh, the sport ecosystem. Uh, this year, uh, Tokyo 2020 would have been the first Olympics with uh, a gender uh, parity. Unfortunately, uh, it was postponed until 2021, but uh, we also saw that uh, the impact of the pandemic uh, was uh, more dire on women. We also saw that, uh, of course, for professional athletes, it was much more complicated, but we realized how much sport is important in our uh, everyday life, uh, physical activity, uh, is important. We don't need fancy infrastructure to stay uh, physically active. And uh, it's very important for our mental health also. And mental health, and this is something that the next generation is very ready to talk about. So I, I, I really uh, praise uh, the female quotient for uh, organizing this and uh, to their leader role in uh, uh, advancing equality in the workplace and you know, uh, the DSG, the Deputy Secretary General, had a campaign because uh, this year is uh, the anniversary of uh, a Beijing Platform of Action. And uh, the campaign is uh, uh, Women Rise for All. And uh, I want to praise uh, the, the female question because uh, this is what uh, you uh, are trying to impact, the power of collaboration. So, um, you know, uh, it's, it's very important to, to keep advancing equality in sport. Uh, we know that much remains to be done. Uh, we, we have the, the six principles that are in general equality framework. And again, you know, I would like to mention uh, some uh, really uh, amazing people. We have uh, uh, allowed uh, things to the lines to move drastically and uh, I, I cannot because I'm a, both a fan of uh, tennis and uh, uh, sports uh, uh, race cars uh, so I want to to mention one who is uh, an emblem for for our, our women's sports community and she's Billie Jean King and another one uh, was Susie Wolf she's a British uh, uh, racer uh, but she's now the team principal of uh, uh, Formula E a Monaco based team. And she has committed to uh, really uh, bringing girls into a sport that is mainly male. So uh, this is, you know, to prove to, to really emphasize uh, woman leadership. Then uh, we saw during the pandemic that uh, at home, uh, it's dangerous for women and girls. Uh, this is 
affect not only the workplace, but also it starts at home. So we, we have to really uh, uh, pay attention to that. We have to uh, undertake more uh, uh, active, uh, active uh, opportunities for achieving uh, equal pay. And here I want to praise uh, the uh, Professional Squash Association which was the first to uh, offer equal uh, prize for women and men. Uh, I want also uh, to emphasize the role of private sector to, uh, for equal participation. And here we have uh, ESP and women who's been a, which has been a, a leader in, uh, in the US. Uh, the Olympics, of course, have a, a very important role to play, the IOC. Then uh, we know that we cannot do anything uh, without grassroots level and civil society. Uh, before we, we, we were all uh, uh, at home, uh, we had the pleasure to host a, a, a meeting at the UN mission to, of Monaco uh, on uh, Skatistan. And Skatistan is, uh, is an organization that really in a very difficult environment for, for girls, uh, is offering them uh, uh, an escape and a way to educate through skateboard in, in Pakistan, but also now in, in, the, in Afghanistan, but also in different countries. So this is uh, very important. The grassroots level, it will be addressed also. Uh, I cited those three uh, important steps at the UN General Assembly, but I, I, of course, I don't want to forget the role of UNESCO. Uh, the Kazan plan of action that was very, very important. The commitment, of course, of the, the IOC and all those uh, initiatives. So I don't want, because we have such a, an amazing uh, group of uh, people that I, I, I'm going to have the, the pleasure to, to introduce and to welcome. Uh, that's what I wanted to say. We need to be more working together. I think we have both the legal framework and uh, the UNGA framework to keep working. Uh, we just need to be more in phase of what is coming back from the field. So the grassroots level civil society and business sector is very, very important. And as I said, you know, the next gen is there. They are uh, very, very much aware of uh, uh, inequalities, not only in gender, but also in social inequalities. They are much more sensitive to non-discrimination and this is obliging the, the brands and the financial sector and the economic sector to, to adapt, which is a good thing because uh, uh, the three pillars of sustainable development are those, you know, it's a common approach. So with this, I want to welcome uh, all participants and I'm going to uh, name them. So we're going to have Mlani Lamini from Girls Talk Made to Play Fun winner from Soweto, South Africa. Kunzie Mambo Dunkirka, of course, the UN Women Executive Direction Director. Irina Gladkish, International Olympic Committee, Associate Director, Winter and Recognized Sports International Federations Relations. Mary Harvey, CEO, Center for Sport and Human Rights. Sarai Behrman, FIFA Head of Women Football Division. Barbara Slater, Director, BBC Sport and member of the IOC Women in Sport Commission. Gabriela Ramos, UNESCO, Assistant Director General for Social and Human Science. And Marta Vieira da Silva, who was honored uh, a few uh, years ago at the UN, UN Women Goodwill Ambassador and uh, United Nations SDG Advocate. She's also a six time FIFA World Player of the Year and she will be joining us by video message. So with these words, I thank you very much. I will be uh, listening carefully and uh, I, uh, I may need to leave you early because I have another meeting, but thank you very much for this opportunity and let's keep working together. Thank you. Uh, and now I give the floor to our, our moderator, um, uh, who is Shelley Dallis. Uh, so she will be uh, introduced by Jennifer Cooper. Shelley, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. I am so honored to be here together. And Isabel, thank you for such an important introduction, especially talking about the power of collaboration. And we always say a woman alone has power. Collectively, we have impact. And this, these 
are the lessons that we learn from sports, from the whole sports model. This is where our role models for change, our role models for standing up for what we believe in, but most importantly, our role models for showing us the power of team. And so UN Women working on sport for generation equality, Isabel was talking about the next generation. We say it's not the next generation, it's the now generation. These are our leaders today. Leadership is not about age. Leadership is not about generation. Leadership is about action. And we are seeing so much action, so much purpose in our next generation's DNA. This is what collectively it will take to make the world a better place, a more equitable world that we all want to live in. And so I really would love to talk about the sport for generation equality principles. And the UN calls on governments, civil society, the sport ecosystem to join in using the power of sport to advance gender equality. And these are the six principles derived from the Beijing platform for action, which we're gonna to discuss today. Principle number one, women's leadership. Number two, ending violence against women and girls. Number three, increasing investment in economic opportunities. Number four, changing the media. Number five, opportunities for the girl child. And number six, monitoring, measuring, and learning. So I am pleased and honored to introduce Mbali Dilamini, Girls Talk Made to Play fund winner from Soweto, South Africa. And so if we could please start with the video. Okay, this is Mbali testing one, two, three, Mbali Jamini from Zoratu. Can you hear me? In our community, there's a lot of body shaming. I really had a very low self-esteem. I didn't believe that I could play sports because of my body. But by playing sports, I grew confident. Boys are encouraged to play sports more. Girls don't have that much opportunity. So I started coaching to teach girls about life and to be empowered through sports. I have one girl who's being abused emotionally. When she attend our session, she's free. Okay, guys, so we get to your body image. Close your eyes. Touch your forehead. Forehead. Some are able to identify the body parts of themselves. Forehead. Eyes. Touch your shoulders. By connecting to their bodies, I give them knowledge to protect themselves. I wish I had this program when I was growing up because I know the feeling that the girls have of not having. There are girls that play with sandals or they play barefooted. So with this funding, we will buy takeys for them and they don't get nutritious food. So we want to buy snacks for my sessions. So they get to play, they get to be energized, they get to learn. I wasn't interested in sports. Then Coach Mbali came, it made me interested. Mbali treats us with respect and even though she's older, she respects us. It makes me feel happy. 
I've seen the girls change in behavior and how they talk now, how they handle themselves. We want them to be joyful and happy. Just live a happy life. My future looks exciting and looking very bright, so I just can't wait for it. Yeah. Bali, that, that gave me shivers and really teaching girls to respect themselves and protect themselves and also all of us protecting each other. Um, what a beautiful message. And it's not what you look like on the outside, it's how you feel on the inside. And what I felt from this video was the power of belonging and the power of believing. So thank you so much. We are so happy to have you here. So for everyone, um, please welcome in Bali. Uh, we will discuss principle number five, undertaking efforts to support equality opportunities for girls in sports, physical activity and physical education. So please welcome the most remarkable in Bali. Hi in Bali. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so I would just love to ask you a few questions and all of us would love to hear. And I see chats starting to come in. So please send in your comments, your suggestions, your questions. We are going to sprinkle them through this entire conversation so that everyone is involved. But in Bali, we'd all love to know how sport has made a difference in, in your life. Okay, thank you so much. So, uh, sports was never in my goal setting. Uh, that is because uh, I had very low self-confidence when I was growing up because I was a very big girl. And therefore, I didn't really think I could be interested in sports. So, because of the things that we go through in life, the, all the challenges that we go through, we find something to do. Uh, a hobby or something like that. So I decided to join sport and also sport has given me that opportunity to be involved in sport as I'm coaching girls from two different schools. Uh, by doing this program, uh, I grew confident because I wanted these young girls to look up to me. So I needed to be positive about myself, about my body, so that I can be the role models to these children. So uh, also sports and women mean gave me that opportunity. And also winning the Made to Play Fund really helped me a lot because I was able to uh, create my netball club called Deep Girls Netball Club to encourage uh, all the deep girls to, to, to play sports. Uh, I needed them to know that uh, regardless of their weight, of their body, they should know that everyone can play sports and they need to be proud of their body and proud of their selves. So sports uh, has given me that confidence that I needed and it has given me the power to reflect on my life uh, and, and sorry about that our sport has made me to reflect on my life and has given me the power to influence others and therefore women win and also sport has given me that right direction to shape my journey in sports thank you thank you and so how does it feel knowing that you are changing the lives of, of so many girls that you coach. Like, how does that make you feel? It's super amazing because I didn't know that I can make people believe in me. I couldn't believe in myself most of the years. So it's very inspiring. It inspires me because I know that I'm inspiring other people. So I'm really grateful for that. I'm very much happy. And so you have a, a global community here holding your hand working with you, wanting to support you? What is your ask of all of us? What can we do to help you support more girls, continue your inspiring, incredible work for change? Uh, one, the most important thing that we need is really support. And we need to, we need you guys to promote us because we don't only want you guys to help our uh, people that are already advantaged, they're used to these things. So people need to reach out to townships because there are people there who are uh, who are not privileged, who are disadvantaged, and they need to know that there are people there. So people need to really come to the townships and inspire kids and also help uh, and also help 
with funding all the NGOs that are out there like women win uh, so that they can continue to do the amazing work that they were doing so that they can not only help girls like me but also the current generation. You know, Bali, there's a quote that says, tell me something I may not remember, teach me something I may not learn, make me feel something, I will remember it forever. And that is what you are doing. You are creating the changes for girls, giving them that feeling inside. That's what it takes to unlock their confidence. You know, confidence is beautiful. You are unlocking the confidence and the beauty of girls in Africa, of course, but they are becoming the role models for change for so many others. So we cannot um, thank you enough for all that you do and know that we are all here. I hope that everyone is hearing the message um, that Mbali is, is, is talking about and the support that we all need to give, not just talking about what we're gonna do, but actually doing what we say we're gonna do. And I think that that is the most important power of the collective is working together to create the changes that we all wanna see. So Imbali, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And I promise you, that I will be there as soon as I can get on a plane and come to Soweto in South Africa to be with you and the girls to play sport together. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so we are very excited to have um, the next discussion with Arena. We will discuss principle one and principle one is all about undertaking efforts to promote women's leadership and gender equality in governance models. And so I am waiting for Arena to come on. Okay, let me see. I think Arena is coming on soon. And Bali, you are getting so many incredible messages. I'm reading the messages. And Bali, you are like a dream. And then we have, um, oh gosh, you are getting, Center for Sport and Human Rights finds inspiration in your work in Bali, bravo. I just want you to know that each and every one of us has the power and responsibility to make a difference. And in Bali, you are getting the love for the work that you do, the human that you are, the kindness that you give, the generosity, that just surrounds you and um, we can all feel through this Zoom call. So thank you so much. And with that, we are gonna come back to Arena. We are going to go to Mary. And Mary, I am going to do an introduction. I see you, Mary. Hi, how are you? You're on mute. Yeah, I'm muted. Sorry about that. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Okay, great. Um, let me just see, because we're going to go a little out of sequence. The introduction will say I played football about 100, 100 years ago. That, that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> but tell everyone your story. Tell everyone who you are, what you do, and oh, how you're just... connected to the sport for generation equality. Uh, compared to who's on this call, I mean, I just think I should just be quiet, but... Um, Never be quiet. Stand up. Stand I know. I'm just kidding. Voice. We need you, girl. All right. So Mary Harvey, Chief Executive Officer for the Center for Sport and Human Rights, uh, former uh, international player, football for the United States Women's National Team, uh, 91 FIFA World Champion, 96 Olympic gold medalist, um, former FIFA executive, uh, and uh, I wrote the first human rights strategy for a mega sporting event, the 2026 FIFA World Cup. There you go. <laughs> okay, well, you're having people that are writing in saying, don't be modest, Mary, you are a superstar. Um, so, so thrilled to I'm have- I'm a team sport athlete. We don't like standing out. And if you're a goalkeeper, a lot of attention means like nothing's gone well. 
So I think that's why we learn so much from sport is there is no I in sport. It's, it's we, and that we all have our roles to play, but it's the power of the collective once again, and you are the perfect role model to inspire that. So, you know, UN Women has just joined the advisory council for the Center for Sport and Human Rights, and the center has just signed on to Sport for Generation Equality. What does this mean for the center in terms of your plans to advance gender equality through this work? We're extremely proud to, proud to welcome UN Women to our advisory council. It demonstrates the confidence uh, UN Women has in us to working with us to promote and protect the rights of women around the world who are involved with sport. Um, working together, we can accomplish quite a bit. Let me outline why I think that's the case. Uh, the Center for Sport and Human Rights is a human rights organization for the world of sport. We work with our global network, uh, and I'll outline who's in that, to align the world of sport with the fundamental principles of human rights. So we do this very specifically by sharing knowledge, building capacity, and strengthening accountability for all actors involved in sport. And we do this through collective action. So we do this through working together. What makes us a little bit different from other NGOs in the space is that our work is rooted in international human rights standards and supports, enables, and promotes the following key areas. Prevention of human rights harms occurring from occurring in sport, providing access to effective remedy where harms have occurred, and working to create positive human rights legacy from sport and sporting events. So those three main areas. Our advisory council now includes UN women, and we're so excited about this because our council brings together the ecosystem of sport and is an unprecedented alliance. First of all, we're grounded in international human rights. So what does that mean? Well, our founders include the standard bearers of those rights, among others, the ILO and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, OHCHR. But also in our advisory council, we bring together governments, are critical to protecting human rights, sports bodies, athletes, hosts, sponsors, broadcasters, civil society, trade unions, and employers. So really the whole ecosystem of sport we bring together and we convene and harness the best available expertise to bring it to bear on solving some of the toughest human rights challenges that affect people in sport and are impacted by sport. And we involve them in the solutions. But the value of sport and human development, and particularly for women, is, is clear. You've already mentioned it. But, and this is the key but, it can only provide that benefit in the presence of effective safeguards. Without these safeguards, perpetrators can infiltrate sport and do what perpetrators do. And unfortunately, we've seen truly egregious cases of violence against women and girls in sport, from gymnastics to triathlon and to my own sport of football. The center's role is to shine the light of responsibility on duty bearers, be they states or governments, sports bodies and others to help ensure victims, girls and women are protected and violators are held accountable. You know, I, I think you also raise such an important point. It's not just about uh, girls and women on the field. It's also about all of us that are off the field and it's, women in the business of sport, women in sport. And of course, it is something gender equality, as we say, is not a female issue. It's a social and economic issue. It's one that we all collectively, men and women need to be working together to affect and impact the changes that we wanna see and how crucial a time it is right now um, where we see a disproportionate impact on women across every category um, and in sports in particular as well that are being impacted um, by COVID and social injustice and racial injustice and everything that we are uh, dealing with today. So there is no such thing as waiting until tomorrow. We must act today, act responsibly, right. act aggressively um, and act in the moment for the changes that we need to create for the girls around us in this world today. So Mary, thank you so much for being with us um, and for all that you are doing. Pleasure to be here. We are gonna bring on Arena now. Let's see. 
see, Arena is coming on. There you are. Arena, do you want to go off mute? And I'm uh, not sure. Oh, there you are. Your video, I know, is going to come in and out. Oh, we see you now. Hi, how are you? I'm good, wonderful. Thank you very much. And very sorry for the technical problem earlier. For some reason, you couldn't see me. I wasn't, I was ready. I was before the meeting started. So some technology, I'm not good at that, but I'm with you now. Thank you for waiting and thank you for inconvenience. Uh, no inconvenience. Right. Sorry, not sorry. You are here and you are with us. And we got to have a wonderful conversation with Mary and hear all that she is up to, and now, Arena, we are so thrilled to have you, International Olympic Committee Associate Director, Winter and Recreational Sports, International Federations Relations. So thrilled to have you here. And um, I, I just would love to ask you a, a question, and then we would love for you to share your slides. Uh, but the IOC supported the development of sport for generation equality principles. Um, in this regard, why is women's leadership and gender equality in sport governance critical for the IOC and the Olympic movement? And can you also tell us about the IOC's gender equality um, review project and the work that has stemmed from it? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you again and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depends where you are. So yes, this project is very dear and near to my heart and I'm happy to speak about this. And uh, again, thank you for inviting me to speak about uh, principle one of the Sport for Generation Equality Initiative. As we, you just mentioned, this principle promotes women's leadership and gender equality in sport governance. And uh, myself, representing the International Olympic Committee, we are very much pleased in the IUC to have taken a leadership role in Sport for Generation Equality Initiative. The reason for that is we believe that sport probably is the most powerful platform for promoting gender equality and empowering women uh, and girls, of course. That's why I'm uh, very much happy to share with you today what uh, we are doing in the IOC and how we are helping to translate this into actions uh, within Olympic movements. So again, as it was mentioned a little earlier by the, by the um, ambassador that we actually we all agree on the, the current crisis presents a lot of challenges for all of us across different areas of life and sport, of course, as well, but seriously impacted. But also it gives us opportunity to uh, rethink and to innovate uh, in our path forward towards a more inclusive, gender equal and sustainable Olympic movement. So in the past few years, International Olympic Committee um, has set some ambitious targets in um, in terms of gender equality and in particular it was under leadership of the current president Thomas Bach who is he for she champion and he has been very 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 strong uh, advocate for gender equality mm -hmm. so and for example Olympic agenda 2020 um, for those who don't know what Olympic agenda 2020 it is an IOC strategic roadmap it does um, uh, provides the recommendation to achieve 50% female participation at Olympic Games. When I say 50% participation, I'm only not talking about athletes quota and athletes uh, numbers. I'm talking about uh, athletes entourage, as well as coaches, technical officials uh, across different um, stakeholders of the games. This is uh, when we when we talk about 50%, it's not just athletes, as I said. We also, uh, encourage uh, international federations to do um, uh, include more mixed gender events in the in the program of Olympic Games. And if you could put my slide first slide on, on the screen, it would be great. If somebody <laughs> not sure. So if um, if I could see the slide, I would like to maybe. Yes. OK, next one. Before you present that, I just wanted to say one thing and comment on what you talked about with he for she. And you know that it is an entire totality ecosystem and having men that are supporting the initiatives, men involved in everything and the actions. And you know, we talk a lot about allyship, and now we're moving into the whole concept of activism. It's not just about being an ally, it's going so beyond that to 
action and how important the actions that we take are in transforming where we were, where we are, and certainly where we need to be. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for, for explaining for those who don't know. But yes, and now, as I know, I have uh, not much time. So and uh, I would like to maybe discuss a little bit of uh, governance side of the IOC. Yes, in 2016, IOC set a minimum target of 30% female representation in all governing bodies of the International Olympic Committee by 2020. So we, 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 we've been discussing gender balance and gender equality in governance across many organizations, and we have to admit and acknowledge in IOC that we also have this challenge. We also have this problem in, in our house and we needed to fix this as well. So we started with ourselves. And as you can see on this slide, the progress have been made and at the IOC and um, uh, we did reach uh, 30% or even more in uh, key areas in the IOC executive board, in the IOC membership and the IOC uh, commission chairs. So, and uh, maybe next slide and um, what interesting to note is comparing to 2008, where women were chairing only one commission out of 27, and uh, now we have uh, women chairing 11 out of 30 commissions. So as you can see, we're going to the, to the balance. But more to that, uh, women are also chairing core business commissions, such like such commission as uh, Coordination Commission for 2026 Milano Cortina and the Coordination Commission for Los Angeles 2028, as well as future host commissions for the gym, for the Games of um, Olympiad. As uh, you can see on this slide, slowly but surely we are moving towards gender balance. So we, we are working hard. We know that we still have lots to do, but we are working on it. So. As you can see, gender equality, as I mentioned a little earlier, 2008, the Olympic movement has also come a long way. So we have seen many international federations and national Olympic committees committing to closing gender gap in, at all levels. And I know that some of them are present today on this call in IFS and IOC. I would like to uh, maybe give some examples. For example, International Biathlon Union, I hope they're with, with us today, and uh, has recently created a gender equality working group of male and female representatives. And this group is mandated to ensure that IBU's gender equality policy is created and implemented in line with international standards. So thank you very much for, for that. And another example is World Athletics. As, as a part of the widespread reforms of uh, the Federation in 2016, the World Athletics seized the opportunity to introduce progressive gender representation quotas into their statutes to ensure that uh, World Athletics achieved gender equal representation in the Council by 2027. Again, I know that some IFs are present today. I would like to thank them again. I would like to thank them not only to start in these initiatives, but, but by learning from each other, by sharing the best practices with each other, and by teaching and, and, uh, and coming to us for advice. So that thank you so much, uh, IFs and National Olympic Committees as well. And coming to the second question about the gender equality review project, which I was a uh, pleasure to be part of from the very, very, very beginning. Yes, I think we can uh, change this, uh, change the slide. So just for, so I was, um, I, I had an honor and pleasure to be part of this uh, gender equality review project from the very, very beginning. It was a very important project just to review the current state of the gender equality in the Olympic movement and achieve gender equality globally with action-oriented recommendations. So the, the whole project review started with an athlete coming to me. I mean, probably many of you know that. It's a very famous hockey player, Angela Ruggiera, who came to me addressing how hockey play, female hockey players uh, treated unfairly in her sport and she was asking me if it's possible to have it addressed for the games of 2018. So we did fix those two issues and I would like to thank uh, International Ice Hockey Federation if they're with us. So, but we started thinking outside of ice hockey. If this issue exists in one sport, it might exist as, uh, across many other sports. So Angela managed to convince IOC president to do the review across all the sports and to tackle not only athletes' uh, quotas and athletes' numbers at the Games, but as well as um, 
uh, to have a, to reach a gender balance in uh, and equ uh, equality in the venues, in the uniform, in athletes' uniform, in the equipment, in the prize money, competition schedule. So this uh, the, the project was growing and growing bigger in the scope. And uh, we had to open the conversation with national Olympic committees, with international federations, with athletes, media, broadcasters, uh, experts in diversity, scientists. So we started interviewing, discussing many, many people to, to understand where we are in, uh, in, in, in the sport area. So the 25 recommendations that came out of this review uh, forged a new path in advancing gender equality in the sporting arena and beyond sporting arena. So, and our success today has been only possible because of good partnership with all of our stakeholders, as I said, international federations, national Olympic committees. It was and it still t is a team effort. So, to give you a concrete example, International Bobsleigh and Skeleton Federation, again, if they're with us today, thank you very much, created a new event for women for the upcoming Beijing 2022 games. So now before uh, the bobsleigh athletes, female athletes could only have one medal opportunity. Now they have opportunity to gain to, to get two medals. So thank you very much. They de developed this um, event in order to grow the sport and give women additional sports to compete at the games. So again, thank you very much for to our collaboration with international federations. Um, and we managed to actually achieve gender balance in the competition schedule. So as many of you know, the competition, uh, we, we, we wanted to ensure that uh, women, um, there's a balanced competition schedule and women competition, um, women get more exposure uh, for the, in the prime time and the weekend days. As a former sport director of Sochi 2014 Olympic Games, uh, I, I would like to say that in the last day of the games, which normally Sunday, it's probably the most visible day in terms of TV audience, we only had men's event. So following this project and following the discussion with, uh, we started with Angela, Pyeongchang 2018 games had a very balanced competition schedule in the last day with 50% between men and women. So and now when we're developing the competition schedule, we already have a gender balance in our mind. And I would like to thank, again, IFs and broadcasters, rights holders for, 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 for openness, for, for flexibility and for readiness to cooperate uh, reaching up. The last slide is, as you can see on this slide, the number of women competing at the Games significantly increased from 23% in Los Angeles 1988 to almost 49% in Tokyo 2020. And we are committed to have full gender uh, equality for the games in 2024. In 2018, Youth Olympic Games in Buenos Aires were the very first, very first games with full, first fully gender balanced. And the second fully gender balanced games were in January 2020, this year, just before pandemic, hit us in, Lo in uh, Lausanne 2020. So we, we started with Youth Olympic Games and moving slowly to the Olympic Games. So, and the very last things, earlier this year, the IUC also took two more key decisions relating to gender equality in the Olympic Games. First, uh, we, um, all national Olympic committees should be represented by a minimum of one female and one male athlete in all edition of the games. Again, if uh, there's an eligible female athlete, of course, and IOC protocol guidelines will be changed now to allow national Olympic committees to nominate a male and the female athlete to jointly bear their flag at the opening ceremony. As you can see, there are much more things we can do and lots of things could be done with no budget, with no uh, resources needed. It's just we need to think a little bit differently. Again, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. And uh, we are committed to continue positive changes across all the spheres of our influence to, uh, to advance gen gender equality in sport. And again, I would like to thank uh, for the invitation and thank all the stakeholders that joined today for their cooperation, for the support and the helping us to achieve our objectives. Thank you. Arena, I, I have to say, you know, one of the things I say all the time, when purpose meets passion, you're unstoppable and you are unstoppable. The progress that we are making collectively, the, you know, we say you can't treasure what you can't measure. So 
that measurement for progress to impact change, the accountability that you are creating is why we are seeing the increase in you know, flipping the balance that you clearly demonstrated. And so you know, thank you for all of that. And most importantly, it's intentionality. We are intentionally putting these guidelines in place, these measurements in place so that the trajectory is changing. And so thank you so much for changing the equation for all of us and for all the mm -hmm. amazing work. There's a lot of questions for you, which we're gonna to get to at the end. So everyone, thank you for sending in your comments, uh, your suggestions, your questions, keep them coming. I will bring them in uh, shortly. And now we have the honor and privilege to welcome Fumzili. Fumzili, I am so excited to see you. UN Women Executive Director, also a member of the IOC, uh, Women in Sport Commission. Uh, the United Nations, I think Fumzili, there you are Fumzili, I'm so happy to see you. Sending you so much love. Um, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. I hope you're all fine. Uh, so we have a few questions for you um, that uh, we want to ask. Uh, number one, the United Nations General Assembly officially celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Platform for Action on October 1st, 2020. Why was this groundbreaking then and how is it relevant today? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Shelley. Uh, thank you, uh, Irina, for that wonderful uh, energy. I miss seeing the members uh, of the of the commission. I hope we're going to meet soon. Um, I what, <laughs> and I'm, I, I look forward to see you too, Shelley. It's been it's been a while, but I'm I'm glad we're keeping healthy. Uh, feel, I, wherever you are in the world, we can all always feel you. Your energy is igniting this entire movement forward. Thank you, thank you. Well, you know, the 25 year anniversary of the signing of the Beijing Declaration and the adoption of the Platform for Action by Member States uh, is a day worth remembering and celebrating. Uh, we were marking the fact that 25 years ago, 189 countries came together and were forced, I have to add, by civil society, by women's organization to have to accept that women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. And with that was a program adopted that uh, puts in place key actions uh, and, 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 and also sort of standards for countries that they need to work towards in order to make sure that the rights are actually being realized by, by women and girls uh, in, 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 in different countries. So what we were marking here is uh, the journey that we've traveled. Some countries have done better than others. I think collectively as women and girls, we have moved the needle, but it has not gone far enough. It's slow. It's unequal and there's no single country in the world that has achieved gender equality. We've also learned in the last 25 years that we need to do this work everywhere and anywhere we are, in sports, in private sector, uh, in governments, everywhere. We need to make sure to push the needle because discrimination filters everywhere. But let me just highlight some of the things that were exciting uh, 25 years ago, which we now take for granted and are totally outraged if it, the needle is not going the right way and we're outraged for the right reason and we must continue to be outraged and to push forward and to make a difference in a way in which Irina was also explaining in the area of sports. Women called for defining the girl child, not just the child, because when we spoke about the rights of children, it masked the fact that girls were forced to marry early because they were girls, something that doesn't happen to boys. It masked the fact that girls experienced genital mutilation, something that did not happen to boys. It masked the fact that in many countries, girls were not going to school and being retained in the same way that parents aspired 
for boys. That started a whole profiling of the needs of the girl child, their health, etc. In sports, we began to understand that we lost, we lose girls as champs during puberty because of all the shenanigans about puberty that society levies on girls, their looks and, and what have you. And then girls become uh, self-conscious and they end up dropping from sports. And the sporting bodies, the good people in sports united together to push the girls, to protect them, to make sure that these stereotypes do not affect girls in, uh, negatively. So the Beijing Declaration still remains what the UN Charter is to the United Nations. What the, the Beijing Declaration is the UN Charter for women. Without it, we take away the instruments that we have to continuously call the member states back to them to sit together around the table and to move in the right direction. You know, Shelley, in the United Nations, we are always negotiating, coaxing, uh, pushing, et cetera you need to have something that you are holding them accountable to. And this is the declaration that we are holding them accountable to. As I'm saying, some countries are doing better than others. Uh, overall, there is movement forward, but not enough. Too slow, we need to sprint. We've been on a marathon, we need to sprint now. Well, I also think you used a very important word that I want to spotlight, which is education. And, you know, when you educate a girl, you educate a family and you give that girl the confidence to bring her whole self, her true self, her best self, you know, to the world. And it, it, it's also legacy issues that we need to reform and transform so that right. we create this next generation with girls being educated and being able to dream the impossible and actually realize the possibilities yeah. that all of our girls, you know, have. And so why, you know, what is your vision for gender equality and what are your hopes for girls just like in Bali, which we, we heard from earlier, you know, all around the world? Um, well, you know, we have uh, as a follow up to uh, the Beijing uh, platform, we have generation equality. Uh, which is bringing together women of all ages, of all walks of life, and women in their diversity. Uh, we have come up with generation equality in order to make sure that uh, the younger generation, the post-Beijing generation feel included. Because, you know, you, it must have happened to you maybe at some point where girls ask you, what is this Beijing thing? that you old mamas are talking about. So you've had to, <laughs> so you have to create something that they can identify with without opening the Beijing Declaration as we know it, because opening it up for renegotiation with member states would have been very dangerous because right now uh, the world is so polarized. If you put this issue on the agenda, the risk is that some of the gains that we made 25 years ago could be taken away. So we added sort of an, an addendum to the Beijing Declaration. That is what generation is about, with the girls at the center of generation equality, addressing some of the new issues that have arisen uh, in the last 25 years, like innovation and technology, which were not as, uh, uh, as visible uh, in, in uh, 25 years ago, the issue of climate change is now on the table. And of course, we want also to celebrate the progress that we've made in sports and make sure that uh, we have sports accompanying us. So for, for the girls like uh, Mbali, this is the time for them to own the space. And this is the time for us to make sure that we're co-creating the future with them. In my work, Shelley, one thing that I feel happiest about, you know, in our work for women, uh, we have a lot of things that really disturb us. But working with young women truly and girls truly fulfills me because of the innovation that is there, the commitment that is there, and the assurance that the agenda is going to be in good hands once you and me uh, are no more able to be as active as we are, but we intend to stay around for, for much longer. And to have these girls stand on our shoulders 
and see much further than we and we can see. So we do want girls like Mbali to be in the space of leadership, to be in the space where they can play a significant role. And we have seen that uh, when girls work together also as peers, they influence each other in, in, a, in a positive way. Our work with the IOC uh, in, 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 in Brazil and in, in, in Argentina, uh, on one win leads to another where we work with girls to encourage them to embrace sports, but also in that process, we teach them about how to fight and to survive uh, violence, how to tell the signs uh, that uh, they are in a danger zone, uh, self -confidence, teach them self-confidence, how to stay healthy. It is phenomenal what these girls have turned out to be. And there are many Mbalis all around, not just the Mbali we have, not just in Brazil, not just in Argentina, but all over the world. We have Greta leading the girls in climate. Uh, we, we have uh, Emeka in South Africa doing the same, uh, shaking the country on issues of climate. And we have many girls who are also fighting to end child marriage in Kenya. Girls are in the forefront of stopping their parents from marrying off their cousins. So um, I think that the future is great and sports is really a good way of showcasing the strength that women and girls have because uh, they do the things that some men cannot do, which uh, humbles uh, the men. And also they do things that men can do, which then shows everyone what the girls are made of. So we are really thankful for the women in sports uh, and for what they do both in sporting as well as in, in leadership? First of all, I mean, I just all around uh, bravo because the, the wisdom that you are sharing and you know, this next generation, we said earlier, they're the now generation, they are our leaders. What they say is they have the voice what they need from us and Jennifer Cooper, if you're, I know you're there, I just wanna thank you for that, the power of, of collaboration. They need us, they need us old mamas, as you said, from Zili, to give the access and the resources. Yeah. We need to listen, we need to learn, we need to hear what they want, which is everything, rightfully so. We need to give that to them. We need to bring our wisdom and our experience um, to the table and that's that power of the collective and you know together we can create change from Zili thank you for all that you are all that you do all that you be um, because you. you are opening up these conversations and it starts with awareness and we need to do a lot more sharing the Beijing principles it, it starts with awareness then it goes to education and then most importantly action and that action will lead to the changes that we all must experience in our lifetime. Not giving this next generation the issues. We need to collectively resolve them so we can move forward with equality and equity for all. And that is Thank you, you. from Zili. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you, Shelley. Um, so uh, I, I see so many questions coming in. I want you all to know I am reading them. I, I see them all so appreciative and we are going to start weaving them in at the end, but I would love to welcome Sarai. So happy to see you here. We are going to discuss principle three, uh, undertaking efforts to close the gap in investment in women's sports and provide equal economic opportunities for women and girls. So, so happy to see you here, uh, FIFA Head of Women's Football Division. Okay, then. That's amazing. How are Hi. you? Hi, I'm good. I'm good. It's uh, a difficult task, I have to say, to follow uh, Pumzile. She always inspires me and motivates me so much every time I hear her speak. So I will try to uh, follow in her footsteps. And I have to say, Shelley, I love the fact that you have a WWE belt behind you. <laughs> Very cool. My title belt, it actually says Chief Troublemaker on it. So <laughs> that, that's my stage name. Uh, thank you to Stephanie McMahon, uh, the Chief Brand Officer of WWE. Um, so here you have it. But Sarai, you know, you just talked about from Zeely, who is a role model and inspiration, um, someone who is paying it forward with gener generosity 
every single day, but then there's you. And what is so amazing is we all are players in, in the ring. We're, we're all in the field together. We're not just fans watching and applauding. We are in the game. And that is truly you and, you know, all that you do. So how and why is, is FIFA investing in, in women's football? Well, I think um, the why part of it is very, very simple. Uh, we have to. It's our obligation, and we should. Uh, women and girls represent 50% of the world population. So why shouldn't we invest uh, in women's football as we do in the men's game? So that part for me is, is quite straightforward. In terms of the how, I think it's important to maybe take a little bit of a, a step backwards in order to understand the context. So for those of you that know uh, football, you'll know that in around 2015, there was a bit of a scandal in football, uh, which led to a reform of FIFA, uh, the governing body of football. And I was part of the reforms committee that was put together to propose the changes to the organization that would avoid uh, the corruption and the scandal that happened. And I happened to be the only uh, female in that committee, which was a situation after working in football for many years that I'd become very familiar with being the single female voice uh, in a room. And one of the, I would say, most important things for the women's game is that an underlying theme in all the discussions that we had as a committee over those six months was that the underrepresentation of women in football, the lack of equal resourcing for the women's game, and the need to prioritize its growth and development were central themes to the discussion on reforming FIFA and reforming football. So women's football was recognized by that committee and later these reforms were approved at the Congress as the single biggest growth opportunity to the sport of football at a global level. And women in football was seen as an absolutely essential component to a better and more inclusive future for football. So after the reforms were improved, uh, approved, uh, FIFA set up for the first time ever in its more than 100 year history, a women's football division dedicated to women's football and women in football. And I think for me, that marks, uh, I would say, the first investment that FIFA made towards the women's game after this reform process. That's the historical context. If we come to the present, uh, we have what we call the FIFA Forward Program, which is the flagship development program for football. Uh, it's available to all our 211 FIFA member associations. And within that, we ring fence funding specifically for investment into women's football. And all the 211 countries can apply for that funding. And part of our job in the women's football division is to monitor the use of those funds to ensure that they are going to the women's game and that they are being invested in women and girls on the ground across the globe. Uh, additionally, we recently launched a, a brand new suite of women's football development programs that are dedicated uh, specifically to support our members to develop women's football on the ground. We piloted these different programs over a two year period. So we really have a fantastic framework of programs that can be tailor made to the different situation in all our different countries. Um, and those are available also to all the 211 FIFA member associations. And then finally, the Women's World Cup last year, it was incredible. We had a huge uh, momentum for the women's game. And after the Women's World Cup, our president announced uh, that we would double the investment over the next four years into the women's game to one billion US dollars in order to maintain the momentum that we'd seen from the Women's World Cup in France. This was a very important uh, statement for FIFA to make. Uh, not only from the investment point of view, but also to send a very, very strong message to the football community and those responsible for delivering football that investing in the women's game is a top priority as it should be for everyone that is responsible for delivering it. Uh, the work is remarkable. And so how do you think that the Women's World Cup is gonna shape the next generation uh, for, in terms of gender equality? It's a good question. I think one of the things that stood out for me in France last year at the Women's World Cup was, aside from what we saw on the pitch 
and the, the records that were broken in terms of broadcast viewership and attendance and those kind of things. That was all amazing, like a huge milestone moment for women's football. But outside of that, there was also really important discussions happening and an important narrative that was taking place around topics like gender equality, equal pay, women's and girls' empowerment. And what I love about the Women's World Cup, not only can it showcase our sport and our athletes and everything that comes around the women's game, but it provides a really important platform for those discussions to take place. And what we saw is that those discussions, which are happening on a daily basis in the women's football community, they became mainstream topics picked up by mainstream media and they were discussed far more widely. And I think in 2023, when we host the next Women's World Cup in Australia and New Zealand, we will be able to further those discussions. And I'm really proud to say that before the Women's World Cup in France, we signed an MOU with UN Women and we're going to use that MOU and our partnership and the Generation Equality Platform to advance those discussions and to really, uh, as Pomzile so eloquently put it, to move from a marathon to a sprint towards what we can do through football to advance gender equality and women and girls empowerment. Well, I also think it's the continuous sprints. It's the continuous pulse that you know we are pushing and and you know less than four percent of highlight reels showcase women in sports and so we need to flip that too because media defines culture culture defines change change defines impact creates impact and with the work that you are doing i know that we are in good hands to continuously sprint faster 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 and together we go further. So thank you so much for all that you are doing. Thank you. And uh, with that, next, we are gonna bring on Barbara. I'm so, so excited to have Barbara. This is just, just like you talk about sprints, or I feel like I'm sprinting with all of you incredible women doing remarkable things. Um, so thank you. So Barbara, um, we're gonna, hi Barbara, how are hi. you? Hi, very good. So happy to see you. We're gonna discuss principle four, undertaking efforts to promote women's equal participation and bias-free representation in sports media, including communications to eliminate harmful gender stereotypes and to promote positive role models. And for everyone, Barbara is director of BBC Sport and member of IOC Women and Sport Commission. So thrilled to have you here. And I think we are gonna open with a video. The pitch can't see. The ball doesn't care. The grass won't notice. The track is above it. Ready? Play. Whistles blow for everyone. Shoes go wherever they are told. Muscles hurt regardless. Sweat falls anyway. We all bleed the same. What they look like isn't who they are. It's not how or why they play. They are not better. Likewise, they are never less. Skill is skill. Sport is sport. There's only a difference if we choose to see one. Oh. I'm just not hearing you, Shelley. I, uh, I was in the perspiration with all those women there. And, you know, and I think that what an important message it's, it's the perspiration, it's the sweat equity, but it's also women play for passion. They play for the game. And I think that that is what is so remarkable. Barbara, I think you're going to share a few. Um, the presentation. Yes. Slides. Okay. I'll yeah. let the slides pop up. Yes. Great. I'm um, not just to say, thank you so much for letting me be part of this. It's been fantastic to hear the speakers and, and what they've been saying so far. So, so, so what I thought you know, might, might, might be helpful and my aim today is to talk you through some of the lessons that we've learned through our increased commitment to women's sport and the success that, that we believe that's brought. And I hope that these lessons 
might be useful for you all as well. So I know we've not got long. So I have just four top takeaways that I, I would I'd kind of love to talk you through if we could move to the next slide. And, and that uh, first one um, is about seizing the moment. And it might sound obvious, but sometimes it is a moment in time, a bit of luck, a great performance, a change, maybe most importantly, in audience perception. And use that as a springboard because, frankly, when it happens, you, you just need to build on it and you just need to seize it. Now, I think for us, one of the really big moments was the 2012 Olympics, where we had, frankly, an array of success for our, with our female athletes, um, um, you know, for, for, for Team GB and some fabulous role models. But interestingly, I thought what we also saw was a real step change in the success of women's team sports, which, which so often have been maybe slightly behind the individual sports. And there was a moment when there were 70,000 people packed out Wembley Arena and they loved it. And it was obvious they loved it, watching women's football. And I think what we saw was an opportunity to... Um, invest in something and that we really believe the audience out there wanted to watch. And, um, and I think that's what we did. Uh, it was, we decided to cover more of the sport. We decided to give it higher impact promotion. And we worked in partnership with the governing bodies. And I don't know if Sarai is still listening to the call, but I would just have to applaud the way that FIFA organized the Women's World Cup in Paris uh, last year. It, it made the broadcaster's job so much easier. So if we move to the second slide, yes, you have your moment to seize, but don't just talk about it, commit. And that is what we did. If you are going to back change, you have to follow it through. And um, I'm not gonna go through all of the things that we did, um, because those changes have been extensive and varied. But what we are in a non-COVID year now is we're up to just over 30% of our total TV um, output is dedicated to women's sport. That's across some 15 to 20 sports. Now, that's a strong commitment um, and one that I think stands out in the industry. Our ambition, of course, is to go further and do more. And indeed, if we spin, if you like, forward, but to last year, we had an unprecedented run of events and we we wrapped it all up in a campaign called Change the Game. And I think one of the really important things about this campaign is it wasn't just showing the sport. It was about the way we presented it. And it was to change some of the perceptions. And I believe when I quickly go through some of the figures here, you will agree that some of the myths like people don't want to which women, women's sport would well and truly busted so um for example if we if we look at the um the the the, the, the women's world cup um which sarai mentioned at the end of her talk what we saw was audiences coming to an event that, that maybe they were less familiar with our audience research told us that only 40 percent of the audience that came to the women's world cup had ever watched a women's football match before and so the figures tell a story. One of the uh, uh, England's first matches, six million. The second match, seven million. The third match, eight million. And it culminated in the semi-final and an audience of 12 million. And that was because people loved what they were watching. And I know it's very easy to bandy these figures around. So let me try and bring that 12 million to life. In the whole of UK television, in the whole of 2019, in any genre, from drama to news, current affairs, comedy, it was the second most watched program in the entire, um, on any broadcaster. And I think if you had said, even to huge fans of women's football and women's sport, whether it was going to be possible to achieve that, I don't think they would have said so. So I, I do think a real, real moment that, as I say, really busts some of those perceptions. So if we go to the next slide, um, for us, it isn't just about the sport. It is about how it is presented. It's how it's reported on and commented on. And um, I and that just doesn't just mean showing women's sport on screen. I think it, it means embedding gender diversity across all facets of the business. And that's on air and off air. And um, I think 
first-hand experience, I, I know that can be challenging in the world of broadcasting. And um, I am the first female director of sport at the BBC. And I think what we've done over time is developed, and you can see on screen, some absolutely brilliant professionals. And they are fantastic. And we are very proud to have um, presenters, commentators and reporters of that calibre reporting on men's and on women's sport. And um, I think there may be slightly more on the negative side. What we've also had and lots of feedback from, from our, our, our sort of women athletes is just how tough the social media world can be. And I know that many, many people on this call will actually um, have a relationship with maybe the social media channels of, of, of a governing body or of an individual sport. And, and, and we found that there is, there is more negativity towards our female athletes and female events. And we've decided that we really want to take a stand on that. So we've done a social media campaign called Hate Won't Win. And what we are doing is we are blocking people we're calling it out. And if they're very offensive comments, we report people to the um, authorities. What's been great in the UK is we've had interest from other broadcasters. And I would just say, could this be an industry wide move that we just don't stand for some of the hate that um, appears in social media and, and, and really stamp it out? Next slide. And that is, uh, is something I've heard said, said many times I think this afternoon, and that's about maintaining the momentum. And, and as you say, I think others turning it into a sprint. And I think what we do is we, we're really proud of the multi-platform sports service that we provide in the UK. And that brings with it, frankly, it's a great privilege. It's a great responsibility. And we are committed for the long term. And, and I think we've seen in the UK other broadcasters stepping up as well and we we want to learn those lessons from the past and and keep making progress and I just think it is worth bearing in mind if, if as a fan of women's sport just what wonderful events that we have in store um, there's a summer and a winter olympic games just on the corner we have a women's european football championships which will be hosted in the uk and a commonwealth games in birmingham what a run of events for female athletes to showcase just how brilliant they can be. Um, I think it's a shame, obviously, this year, I think COVID has disproportionately affected um, female sport, uh, and I think that's a great shame, but I don't think there is any stopping the momentum. Thank you, um, Shelley. Barbara, uh, first of all, incredible work. Mary Harvey says she would like to connect with you to talk about how... Right. Uh, to bring us, I'm just passing that message to you. Thank you, Mary. And, and you talked about maintaining the momentum. I want to go to accelerating the momentum. And so yep. I have one very important question for you, which is how, you know, what is your message, your advice to broadcasters and members of the media to advance gender equality? We must do more. And as I said, right before you came on, media defines culture. You have power of, you know, the voice. So what, what do we do? So I would, I would say what we've always tried to do is lead our audience. Don't get too far ahead. If you get too far ahead, you, you're not going to take what I would call the critical mass with you. So, so, I mean, I really do mean that lesson was seize the opportunity. We felt there was an appetite. There was a great product um, particularly around the women's football, that maybe a lot of people didn't know about. And so what we did was we were very bold. We put it on peak time. We put it on BBC One. Some of those programmes were slot negative. Either they didn't quite um, match what a normal programme might get in that given slot. But by the end of the event, it was beating the slot average. And so it did take a leap of faith. And what I would say is, um, and I hear it and I see it in the broadcasting industry, a kind of nervousness about really getting behind events, particularly women's sports events. And I just think um, what was achieved last summer through obviously the brilliance on the pitch, the great event organisation, a number of bodies working together, the investment that FIFA made. So all the host co coverage looked brilliant was just so important. And when you think 40% of people had not watched women's football, a women's football match before, that product needed to be good. What you didn't want to do was use that precious moment when new audiences were coming to something and, and in a way leave them not wanting to come back for more. So 
I, I think there has to be many things that come together. There has to be the quality of product. And then there has to be the backing of that. Well, that moment creates the impact. And you yeah. know, when you talked about busting the perceptions, we need to bust the perceptions and create and showcase the reality of, you know, great brilliant news. thought. Brilliant. It's as simple as that. As simple as that. Let's let's leave us on that thought. It's as simple as that. We need to walk the talk. It's as simple as that. Thank you, Barbara. You are thank fantastic. you. Don't forget Thanks. to follow up with Mary. Mary. Uh, fantastic. And next, a uh, thrill to introduce Gabriela Ramos, UNESCO's Assistant Director General for Social and Human Sciences. Gabriela, excited to see you. Hello, how are you? Well, I'm, I'm so excited about joining you and uh, listening to these wonderful experiences that we have heard before. Huh? Well, you know, we've heard all of them. They're all the sprints in our journey, as we've talked about. And now we're going to hear about another one. We're going to discuss principle six, agreeing to monitor and publicly report on progress on an annual basis. And this is where accountability really comes into play. And so, um, Gabriella, for you, you know, can you share with us how UNESCO is promoting gender equality in and through sport, and in particular, how UNESCO is supporting expanded knowledge and data on the subject? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shile. And, and I, I completely agree with you. I'm very uh, honored that UNESCO is going to be contributing to all the principles because we have a full agenda uh, on promoting uh, gender equality, but also gender equality in sports. You know that UNESCO has education, culture, science, and the sports as their main parameters. And in each one of our work, we have gender equality as a global priority. And therefore I'm very proud because I was before with the OECD and I was before with the G20 and I have been promoting gender equality. So I'm, I'm so glad to be here with UNESCO which has gender at, at its core. And, and I think that we are very well prepared to bring an additional angle that has not been touched upon by our fantastic speakers because they're practitioners, they're from associations, they go and do it. <laughs> but here we have the power of all the intergovernmental, all the countries that are committing. And we also have the power of, of calling them into account an accountability issue. We have our Kazan Gen, uh, Sports uh, uh, Action Plan, uh, which has core uh, reaching gender equality in sports. And this was achieved in 2017. We have the ministerial, the global ministerial meetings on sports, which have, have also called to uh, achieve uh, gender equality and investments, as uh, many of the speakers have uh, underscored on the on, on girls and on women. Um, the intergovernmental committee for physical education. So we have many instruments and many institutions that are really looking forward to contribute to this very important undertaking that we are uh, now taking uh, with you. And let me tell you, it's not only about how do we ensure that women are treated equally, that they have the same opportunities, that they have the same uh, quality in terms of accessing to sports and, and fulfilling their full potential through sports. But we also believe, and this was something that it was meant by, uh, was mentioned by, by the FIFA um, representative, uh, that we need to ensure that women is also well represented where decisions are taken in the sports industry. And we are very far behind. And this is something that our international chapter for physical education, physical activity and sports underlines, and I want to quote it, it says equal opportunity to participate and be involved at all supervision and decision-making levels in physical education, physical activity and sports, and it's the right of every girl and every woman that must be actively enforced. But you are right, it's not only about the commitments, it's the follow-up. And mm -hmm. I, I come very well prepared to this discussion because we, we have just uh, launched a very important initiative, which is the observatory for um, women, sports, physical education, and physical activity. This is sponsored by the, by the government of Switzerland, and we are very proud of it, because the observatory will connect and convene as a space for coordinated efforts between the stakeholders to promote, promote women in sports to guide and advise major actors in conducting sector analysis and creating action plans for gender equality in and through sports. So we're gathering the information there. The evidence is so important to have it well-recorded, comparative, standardized, benchmarked, 
we need to bring the good experiences, we need to bring the bad experiences, we need to inspire countries to move ahead in, the, in this uh, situation, all the stakeholders, and produce, produce the evidence and the evaluation methodologies, as well as conduct independent monitoring and gender equality and sports commitment. Nothing better than name and shame. And I know that our countries don't like that too much, but I can tell you that benchmark works and that's what we want to do. If you committed, we need to bring all the evidence. We need to bring the indicators. You also said it, Shelley, we need to measure what we treasure and we need to put together the indicators and the analytics to inform policy, to inform decision-making, to put in front of everybody, where are we and where we want to go. And I have to say that uh, we also have the Fit for Life uh, project, which is also trying to promote the sports because there are these dual elements of gender uh, equality in sports, which is uh, our initiative, but also the fact that sports is absent from the COVID recovery plans. We need more investments in sports. We need more investment in youth. Youth is going to have a big problem with mental, mental health. And so you almost connect the two things, uh, the sports and, ge and gender and youth, together and, and is really delivering greatly. So we are going to be gathering the statistics, the evidence, the tools. We are going to see what works, what doesn't. Uh, we are going to be also promoting the kind of initiatives that we heard today to really inspire people and to, to, to say it is possible. It is possible, we know how to do it. We, we can share the information. We're here to, to learn together how to do it and we need to change uh, the, 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 the outcomes. It's a long shot notwithstanding the great progress that we have heard from our previous speakers. Uh, I dream of a world where we will have more than one sports woman in the force 100 top earning sports people. I, I would dream uh, that women will have more than 10% media space for their sports. I was in the Tour de France. Nobody saw the Tour de France of women. Everybody was looking at the Tour de France, no? I live in Paris. I dream of a world where, where everybody will go out in the streets when the Lyon, the, 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 the football uh, team comes out and win the championship and, and, and the celebration are not uh, as half as they were when they celebrated the semifinals for men. So I feel that there's lots to be done and I can, and I can come in terms of, 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 of wage uh, the inequalities, in terms of airtime, in terms of media, in terms of sponsoring, in terms of abuses, which is the, the, terrible, uh, the most terrible issue in sports and how do we avoid uh, the abuse of, of, of girls and women. Uh, and then of course, to use the power of sports to emancipate women. We, see, we saw it with Mendlavi and we, we want to also document those experiences because the fact is that uh, when you think of women as being uh, um, sweet and nice, don't taking risk and, that, and then you see these fantastic uh, uh, and now skills is a skill, sport is a sport. And then you gain autonomy you break the stereotypes because you're powerful. You go out, you, 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 you earn your, your uh, uh, outcomes because of your effort and not because of your gender, but we need an equal footing. So we're here to help and we are very committed to, to continue monitoring and holding everybody accountable. Well, I have to say, Gabriella, a taboo word for women is power, as you said. So uh, let's just break the news right here. You heard it here. You can be powerful and nice at the same time. So don't think that they are not interchangeable and that they can't happen at the same time. And the other thing that you talked about that was so incredibly important is you talked about shame and blame. You know, we talk about celebrating those that are taking action. You know, one of the reasons we've gone backwards is we are doing the same thing in silos. We need to do the same thing together. That collective action is where progress happens. And if we don't measure where we are, we, you know, we, I always say equality is a choice, unconscious bias is an excuse. Once you use the word unconscious, you're conscious. When it's conscious, you have a choice. Do something or don't. We all need to take that responsibility, not wait and watch, but get in the game and create the actions that we all need to see. So Gabriella, thank you so much for all that you are doing and all that you share today. And let's keep holding all of us accountable for the changes that we need to see. And count on UNESCO. All in, thank you so much. Um, so now everyone, we have a, a wonderful special video message. 
um, that we can't wait to share from Marta Vieira de Silva, Brazilian footballer. Um, and we're going to play this message for you. O esporte mudou a minha vida. Agarrei as oportunidades, trabalhei duro e cheguei ao mais alto nível. Todas as garotas devem ter a chance de ser o melhor delas. Você precisa acreditar em você mesma. E você é capaz de fazer isso. A próxima geração deve ser a geração de igualdade. Podemos mudar esse mundo juntos. Uh, we are all back and um, bringing us all back together. Um, uh, so Marta, Brazilian footballer who plays for the Orlando Pride in the National Women's Soccer League and the Brazil national team as a forward. So um, thrilled that she joined us for a special video message. And now we're back and I wanna thank everyone for your questions and all of your comments. I was integrating them through the conversation. I would love to just do a quick speed round looking at all of you on the tiles. And we talked about the power of the collective. It does not get more powerful than having each of you using your voices, standing up, standing out, but most importantly, standing together, which is what generation equality is all about. So if you could all just each tell me, you know, what does generation equality mean to you? Why is it so important? And Fumzili, um, let's start with you. Um, thank you, Shelley. Uh, you know, for me, generation equality uh, introduces uh, a, a, a young women and girls into recreating the world because in young people, the world has an opportunity to reshape itself because they bring a fresh perspective. So generation equality is about us uh, bringing in younger people, as well as bringing women and men from all walks of life to take the responsibility to make sure that in the next five years, 2020 to 2025, we are sprinting uh, in pushing forward uh, the agenda for gender equality because we know so much already of what needs to be done. So we know exactly where to go in order to make a difference. So you know, we're so open for business. That is what generation equality says. And we open for everybody to be a participant and in particular young people. And many of them are very sporty. Thank you from Zilli. And that word open, such an important word, open, open to change, open to sprint, open for progress. We are not going back. We are only going forward. There is only one way to go. Gabriella. And you're on mute. You're on mute. I, I would say that uh, generation equality is, is so important by, because by achieving gender equality, what we are aiming at is not only uh, recognizing the important contribution of women, recognizing the need to, to, to uh, respect and, and provide women with the same uh, basis of men, but more than anything, if we respect women, if we allow for equality to flourish, we will be building more peaceful, more compassionate, more balanced world for everybody, for mm -hmm. men and for women. Therefore, I don't think uh, men wins when there is violence against women. I don't think they win when there is inequality and discrimination because at the same time, these kind of values are going to get them. Therefore, I feel that we should all encompass an agenda of equality for women to build a better world. And we need that. We have seen it with, with COVID. Fantastic. In Bali, and I hope in Bali you were reading all of the messages in the chat that were directed at you. <laughs> yes, I was. Thank you. Uh, gener generation equality is important to me because 
it uh, it allows us to have uh, the same opportunities as the male have, and I, as a girl child, have has the voice, and my voice can be heard. And as Mapumzile has said, uh, we as women can do much and can do better than men, and therefore I am generation equality. Thank you. I am generation equality. Thank you for that. Uh, Bumzili is clapping. Mary, you're on mute as well. Yep, no, I'm, I'm off. Uh, because as Fumsili uh, has already said, uh, and those before her, human rights are women's rights and because women's rights are human rights. So until we see, I mean, there are many ways that the center is connected to this, but until we see an end to violence against women and girls in the world of sport, sport will not be fully aligned with the fundable principles of human dignity, human rights. Um, so by more, we mean specifically mobilizing athletes as role models to help promote prevention measures, ensuring safe reporting when bad things happen, um, when girls and women need to feel safe when they report. Victims of violence must have access to remedy and that includes within sports. Um, sports organizations must make a commitment to respect internationally recognized human rights and that includes eliminating all violence against women and girls in sport and committing to zero tolerance to such violence, right? Zero. Sport organizations must have effective safeguarding procedures in place. And I mentioned that earlier. It's not enough just to have sport for women. You have to make sure at the same time that they're safe. Sport organizations should regularly monitor and report on measures they're taking to respect the right of women and girls to make sure we're on track for achievement of the SDGs. And the countries must have legislation in place that protects women and girls in sport. Sport is absent from a lot of treaties that concern protection of women and it needs to be added. So these ambitious goals can't be attained by any single stakeholder. And you mentioned collective action. This is where we live. This is core to how the Center for Sport and Human Rights uh, moves the needle and affects change. And uh, thank you so much for having us. Inspired beyond. Uh, Barbara. Um, I suppose I'm, I'm just a believer in the power of sport as a force for change and a force for good. So I think girls and women should benefit through that just as much as men. And I think it's interesting because in a way sport is such a good um, or oh, uh, litmus paper, if you like, for, 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 uh, for so many things. And, and, and while we don't have equality in sport, frankly, we don't have equality. And uh, I, I think it can be a place where there is such potential for change and it will be so symbolic, that change. Force for change, a force for good. Right. Look, I love this generation equality movement because the importance of gender equality and the movement behind it transcends generations. And it doesn't matter whether you're one of the old mamas that Pumzile referred to or you're part of the new generation like in Bali. You know, this movement is something that brings us all together, that we can work collectively, as Mary said. And it gives us a clear point of focus. You know, there are six very clear principles that are laid out within this generation equality movement and it allows us as stakeholders and a collective group to have focal points how we can move forward and, and sprint <laughs> towards outcomes um, in all of those areas. So it's really important and I'm very, very happy to be part of it. You know, just when you said that's right, I was thinking, you know, generation for equality, we are one generation. We are not five generations, we are one generation united for equality. That is what it is all about. And we all need each other to create the changes we need to see. One generation for equality. Arena, I see you there. I don't know if you can come in with video. I'll take it either with just your voice or voice and video, you choose. There you are, great. I came with both. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, I was listening and I was, uh, uh, remember how we started the project of uh, gender equality review and uh, 
for me, it was the biggest learning ever. I didn't know, I mean, uh, how women could be, how much women can bring to the table, how much women can bring to, to, to sport and how important to, for women to have equal opportunities with men when in, in sport and governance and everywhere. Again, for me, it was the biggest learning. And now I'm, as you can see, how passionate I am about the whole project. So I do want us to work together on making changes. So as I already said, this changes doesn't require lots of uh, sometimes resources. It's just thinking a little bit differently and women will have absolutely different opportunities, similar equal opportunities as men. So again, let's start thinking differently. <laughs> let's work together. As I, as I already mentioned, working together with IS, with NOCs, we learn from each other, we help each other, we support each other and we make changes make big difference now well for me champions of change are champions and we all get the gold when we are about advancing gender equality and supporting generation equality so thank you all for being on the sprint uh, sprinting on this journey together we are all winners when it's all about progress and moving forward. So thank you again for all that you are, all that you do, all that you be. Uh, we are all in this together. So thank you, thank you, thank you with so much gratitude for creating a more equitable future together. And with that, I would love to thank the UN, the UN women for all that you do um, and and also welcome Jennifer Cooper, uh, who is the um, UN Women Program Specialist and also someone I'm proud to call a very dear friend, uh, where it is yes, and then it's what can we do together because we know that's where we go. We go further, faster, always together. So with that, Jennifer, bring us home. Thank you so much, Shelly, Gabriella, Barbara, and Bali, Mary, Sarai, Executive Director Irina, and to all the those who were able to join us uh, today for this very important discussion, I am so inspired by by what all of you are doing. And as we've said many times today, it's all about the collective. And I think if we can mobilize the sport world to bring us along on this journey to realize the those goals and those uh, principles that were laid down 25 years ago in Beijing we are going to make a huge difference and we are going to be on that sprint. So I welcome all of you who are not only on the panel, most of you have committed already to join us for Sport for Generation Equality and to commit to those principles. But for those of you who are listening as well, please uh, do visit UN Women's website where we have more information. Just look up Sport for Generation Equality and uh, we will welcome you into this race. So thank you once again to everybody. It has been an absolute pleasure and an honor. And uh, I look forward to checking in soon to see what progress we can make. Thank you all.